If this goes on, don't panic. Bringing hope to the world through speculative fiction. Episode 7. In this episode, we will be interviewing writer, editor, interviewer Arlie Sorg and editor, writer Christy Yant. All right, Diane, how are things going? Well, it's been a pretty busy few weeks for me. I've uh, been involved yeah. in a lot of projects. I've been doing a challenge on World Anvil. It's been uh, it's been keeping me pretty hopping. I'm way behind on all my Patreon stuff. I'm sorry to my patrons. <laughs> How's, how are things going with you? Tell me about tell me about your world animal stuff. Oh. Because you owe me a little bit of an explanation oh, because yeah, oh yes, because you pretty much were impossible to get a hold of that. Entire, I know. I don't know I, two weeks or I know it's. I'm sorry. Okay, so the challenge <laughs> is called summer camp, right? And the idea is to write. Uh, they give you prompts for your universe, and you're supposed to. Uh, there's 33 prompts to be done in 30 days. Now, the idea, of course, is to do like a little brief paragraph or whatever, and then move on to the next one. But there are prizes for articles that are really well done. And, uh, I, you know, me, I just can't leave a project unfinished. I'm like, no, that's not uh -huh. enough information. I have to put more in there. So I found that I was working uh -huh. really hard on it. And I was doing uh, Camp NaNoWriMo. At the same time, I was going to do... Oh, Lord. No, 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 no. I, I started with this idea like, okay, you know, I can do them both. No, no, no. So I ended up counting my <laughs> uh, World Anvil material towards my Camp NaNoWriMo goals. <laughs> and I made right. them easily. <laughs> so that, that tells you something. But it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And then we did... Um, I've got a Twitch channel up and running now. And... Some of, of course, some of the episodes have been, the live episodes have been recorded on my Twitch channel. And uh, a bunch of the people on World Anvil went, let's get together and do like this group and help each other out. So we created yeah. the Anvilite Streamer Corps. And I got involved in volunteering, getting that off the ground. And uh, it's amazing. It's a wonderful, supportive community. Definitely shout out to them. But, uh, you know, it's it kept me pretty hopping. So I'm sorry wow. that I was not available. Wow. No, no worries. No worries. I just, I needed to hear the down low, you know, what was going on. Right? Yeah. Why were you so busy? But it does sound like, it sounds really intense, but also awesome. It was great. Yeah. So let's see what's going on with me. Yes. Um, two cool things going on. Um, my kid is reading The Hobbits, or we're reading it together, which is neat. Awesome. You know very influential for me personally. And we're also um, being very good quarantine people. And we have started a family D and D campaign. Oh yeah. Right on. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. I have a um, child who's still a toddler who's somehow going to be involved. We think we're going to make him a gnome barbarian or something like that. Always make the toddlers barbarians. They can never screw it up that way. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. And then um and then and then my wife who is like not into fantasy anything is like I guess I'll play. Uh so that's going to be interesting. And my stepdaughter is going to be running it cuz I'm like um I don't have time for that stuff between <laughs> work, kids and podcast. Nope. So, but she's been into it through her boyfriend. She's gotten into it. Um which is kind of cool. So, to make it easy, we went out and purchased like a a uh, what do they call those like um um uh, a pre-built uh, uh, campaign, you know what I mean? So, sure, a module. But I'm really looking forward to it. A module. A module, yeah. Those, yeah. It's going to be really cool. I haven't played D&D in like 10 years because I've just, you know, I went really deep in the music for a long time. It's probably been 15 years, honestly. But I'm really excited about it. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be really cool. That's great. Let me know how it goes. It sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I will let you know. So I suppose we should probably get to our wonderful guest we today. Should. He was kind enough to be here and you know spending time with us. So yeah, 
All right, so this week we have Arlie Sorg and Christy Yant. Um, so when we are back, we will have uh, Arlie Sorg and Christy Yant with us. Hey, you all know I'm a supporter of Dreamforge magazine. You might wonder why you should support Dreamforge too. First, Understand that Dreamforge is a new kind of science fiction and fantasy magazine that is looking for hopeful futures in a time when it seems hard to find that. Second, check out their magazine. The illustrations are beautiful. Personally, I was very impressed by the cover of the third issue. Additionally, they have top-tier talent writing in the magazine, like Jane Linskold, Dave Weber, and Mary Soon Lee. They also have new authors to discover, too. And if you're like me and read a lot on the bus... They have a portal set up for you, so you can read the magazine on your phone or tablet. There are plenty of other reasons to check them out, too. You can find them at dreamforgemagazine.com. That's D-R-E-A-M-F-O-R-G-E-M-A-G-A-Z-I-N-E dot com. Okay. So... Uh, we are now here with Christy Yant and Arlie Sorg. Welcome, Christy and Arlie. Hi. Hi, guys. Thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. I just want to hear about your D&D stuff. Can we just talk about that instead? <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't get me started. I'm an old gamer. We'll be here for hours. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I will say one thing. Um, my older son, who's who's pretty young, um, he rolled the the best statistics I've ever seen in my life. Oh yeah, oh, no. I mean two eighteens. Oh, wow, good for him. Yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> you, you guys are gonna have so much. And we fun. didn't like cheat. It just it just happened that way. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I started playing D and D back in first edition. <gasps> you and me both. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Ben Bars, Lift Gates, and the cool all the cool charts. Yep. Yep, and nice. how you could never have the zero zero eighteen zero zero strength if you were playing a female character. So I played male characters whenever I played fighters. Yeah. <laughs> oh, ouch. <laughs> ouch. Yeah, I started when Alan quit about fifteen years ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> right on. I um God, I think I started. I started in this weird edition between two and three, or maybe it was between one and two. I'm not really sure. But it was like this brown cover with this guy kind of riding this like wor- a, a worm like dragon on the front, and there's another guy on the horse, kind of like taken aback by the dragon, looking like he's. Ever- but I actually looked it up online, and I guess it's worth something because it's kind of like a rare uh, version of D and D, which I just happened to have bought when I was like ten, you know. Um, yeah. Wow. yeah. Huh. Yeah, it's I don't I have, I have no idea even it came out in ninety or ninety one. I can't remember. Huh, I'll have to ask my friends about that. See if anyone knows what that is. That's very cool. Yeah, if I had it here, I would I would I would be happy to talk about it. But our listeners probably be like, "Why the hell are you talking about this?" <laughs> and uh, and yeah, they probably don't want to hear me talk about you know read out of a D and D manual. <laughs> <laughs> well, send me a picture on the on you know one of our social communication things and i will see if i can track it down i bet aaron will know aaron's my hubby he's been doing it forever he knows like Mm. so much about this stuff so wow yeah yeah that'd be cool we will have to try and do that remind me because i will forget i'll remind you so we should probably do christy and arlie's um bios before we get too far into this yeah um how about i do christy's and you do arlie's does that sound good (laughs) you didn't give me any cliff notes okay i'll look it up oh oh you did that's right i'm sorry that's my okay. I'll do both. <laughs> <laughs> We're very organized here, I swear. Okay, uh, Christy, here's Christy's bio, so everybody knows. Christy writes and edits science fiction and fantasy on the central coast of California. She was part of the editorial team of Lightspeed Magazine from its launch in 2010 through 2015, and remains involved with it and its sister publications as associate publisher. In 2014, she edited the Women Destroy Science Fiction special issue of Lightspeed Magazine, yes. which I have somewhere around here. Um, that won the British Fantasy Award for Best Anthology. She has since co-edited four anthologies and relaunched Fantasy Magazine with co-editor Arlie Sorg. She currently tries to balance her writing life with her editing life, 
with varying degrees of success. I could totally understand mm. that. That's a mood. And then Arlie, what's that? I said that's a mood. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We all, all of us with projects, we all understand. <laughs> uh, Arlie was born at March AFB, California, but grew up in England, Hawaii, and Colorado. Arlie, you get around, man. Yeah. <laughs> He kicked around Santa Barbara for a while and went to Pitzer College. Somehow he landed in the Bay Area. Arlie works as the Fantasy Magazine co-editor-in-chief with Christy Yans, the Locust Magazine associate editor, film reviewer, and occasional book reviewer, Lightspeed, Nightmare Ma- uh, Lightspeed slash Nightmare Magazine's associate editor, reviewer, and occasional spotlight interviewer, and Clark's World Magazine interviewer, and the Cascadia Subduction Zone magazine book reviewer. Holy cow, Arlie. <laughs> yeah. A finger in every pie. Wow. Yeah. Seriously, like, <laughs> if we took you out of science fiction, every single magazine would collapse? Yep. Is that what? <laughs> yep. I think you're right. You're right. I, I see busy. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Holy cow. That is crazy. So thank you for joining us again. Um, I guess let's let's just kick off talking about Fantasy Magazine. So, like... Uh, you've restarted Fantasy Magazine. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Fantasy Magazine and why you wanted to restart Fantasy Magazine? And why start a magazine now? Sure. Um, so Fantasy uh, was uh, originally published by Prime Books, uh, owned by Sean Wallace, who and he also started uh, Lightspeed. And he had brought John Joseph Adams on to edit Lightspeed and uh, eventually brought him on to edit Fantasy as well. Um, when we bought Lightspeed and Fantasy from Prime Books, oh gosh, eight years ago, something like that, um, John decided to fold the Fantasy part into Lightspeed. So um, fantasy just kind of became this placeholder. Uh, we used it a couple of times, we resurrected it for the Destroy project. So we had, um, you know, women destroy fantasy, queers destroy fantasy, people of color destroy fantasy. But otherwise, that site has been fallow. Um, you know, we've been, you know, we've had the uh, ebooks of back issues available, but it hadn't been doing anything for a long time. Um, and then Arlie and I had a conversation one day, just catching up as friends. We hadn't seen each other in a long time. And uh, Arlie, I'll throw to you. So Christy and I were hanging out virtually, of course, because this was in the after times. <laughs> the time and of the apocalypse. We, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we started talking about how we both had been considering um, starting a magazine, uh, each of us independently. And Uh and we started talking about uh, the different approaches we were thinking about. And then um, it just kind of clicked like, you know, we should totally do this together. And the way that we view the field, uh, the way that we talk about fiction the things that we like, um, the things that we want to do, the impact we want to have, a lot of it really clicks and overlaps. And so it just it just made sense. And it just came together very organically. Um, and then, uh, you know, John, John Joseph Adams, mm-hmm. um, you know, he was like, really excited when we talked to him about it. So it just it just all came together in a really natural way. Yeah. Yeah, the infrastructure is already there. Um, again, Arlie and I have been both talking about doing our own projects. And you're not the first people to ask us why now. Um, and I don't yeah. think there's a real answer to that, except that now is when we're doing it. You know, it wasn't like, oh, there's a pandemic. Let's go, you know, make a magazine. <laughs> um, yeah. It was just, it was something we'd both been thinking about. And and it was maybe 10 minutes from the time that we were just updating each other to the moment we both went, oh, we got it. We're just this is what's happening. We're doing this together. Hang on a minute and let, you know, let's, let's go see if, if this will work for John. And it did. He was so excited. So, um, yeah, it's not, uh, it wasn't, uh, the timing is not any kind of statement. It's not, um, you know, the, the things that are going on in the world aren't particularly relevant, but we're very glad that it, that we're doing it now because, um, I think it's given people uh, something to be excited about, and I know the writing community has been very welcoming, and um, and I think, uh, you know, it, another paying market is never a bad thing, right? So Yeah, sure. Yep. 
I think it's interesting too because um, I don't know, probably about a year ago, maybe a whole bunch of magazines kind of closed at the same yep. time. Yeah, everything yeah. just folded all at once. It was very disheartening. I have to say, as a writer, <laughs> I was looking yeah. at this and going, "Oh my god, there's no. Is there a career in this yeah. anymore? Maybe I should be mm. concentrating on long fiction." You know. <laughs> mm. Mm. But you, but you have to, you have to look at those things. You know, this is something I learned at Locus, and I think that. Um, I think that as the writer side, we tend to get tunnel vision and we, we tend to focus on our own experience, but something that working at Locus has given me is it's given me a broader view of the whole genre market as a whole. And these things are really cyclical. They're very, you know, like magazines close and open all the time. You know, if, if Gardner Dozois were here, for example, he would regale us with stories about, you know, the important magazines that were around 20 years ago that have been completely forgotten and just closed, but people loved them back then. You know, Omni is a great example, mm-hmm. yeah. which Datlow edited, you know, like back in the day, Omni was the thing. And now, uh, you know, there's this whole batch of new writers that have never heard of mm-hmm. it. So, I mean, from my perspective, magazines close, magazines open, a few lucky ones uh, get to stay around for a long time. There's this uh, magic spot, which is, a, you know, a combination of luck and of dedication and of hard work. But that stuff happens and you got to focus on, I feel like you got to focus on finding readers. You got to focus on doing the best you can and you got to focus on putting out a really great product and so some markets you know they open uh with uh you know their own agenda is not the right word um their own goals in mind so lightspeed actually launched the very same day that redstone sf launched i don't know if you remember those guys um but uh we got to know the editor uh, pretty well at the time because you know we're it's a very I I like the word coopetition. You know, we're we're hmm. we're more we're a more cooperative uh, field than we are competitive typically. Um, mm-hmm. And the the editor of Redstone was a writer, and he had a two year timeline. He was going to publish this thing for two years, and he wanted to do it because he wanted to see the back end. He wanted to learn um, more about writing, about publishing, and he felt that launching a magazine was the way to do it. And he was he was a paying market. He was well respected, but he had a two year timeline and he closed. So yeah, we've we've seen a lot of them come and go. Uh, Shimmer, the the fact that Shimmer is gone was one of the reasons that I was thinking about doing something myself because my aesthetic. Uh, lines up with them a lot. Um, they've published one story of mine, and and I missed them, you know. And I thought, well, that's that's a hole in the market now that maybe I could fill. And I was thinking about doing a little mm-hmm. quarterly of my own, and I'm glad that I get to do something bigger than that. So, yeah, I was very disappointed by Shimmer closing too. So that's awesome. Yeah, uh, I was too. Uh, Christy and I had that in common. We had many yeah. things in common, but that's yeah. one of the things specifically that we talked about. Uh, in our hangout that we, you know, and I think that just helped us click as well. Mm-hmm. Just when we're talking about what's going on in the market and you have this discussion where you just see eye to eye very well, it really enables you to, you know, collaborate on a project and it really builds yeah. excitement. That's awesome. It's funny that you mentioned Omni because the last time Diane and I talked to some editors, it was uh, the folks over at Dreamforge. And they also brought up brought up Omni as uh, an inspiration for them, so that's that's why. We have a bunch of issues of Omni in the Locus office, so I, it's like <sighs> always staring me in the face. Yeah. Oh man, I used to I used to subscribe and I'd read those and like someday, someday I will be published by Ellen Datlow. Uh-huh. Still haven't been. Still haven't been. It's still on my list. It's on my bingo card. I used to wait for them to arrive at the supermarket and get them as soon as they appeared. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, Collected the art as yeah. well. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I miss. We're, we're dating ourselves a little <laughs> bit here, but <laughs> we are. But that's, that's okay. All right. That's all right. So, like Chris, you had mentioned maybe this could be a quarterly, or like how often do you guys think? Oh this no, coming no. Out? Yeah, no, we're we're doing monthly. But the the little thing that I thought I was going to do on my own maybe was potentially uh, month uh, quarterly. But no, we're we're going to be monthly. Um, we're on the same schedule as Nightmare and Lightspeed. So is this going to be part of like the Lightspeed thing or the family? 
Yes, yes. So uh, John Joseph Adams is, um, well, I keep saying that, but we we have our own thing now. So we, we also at the same time um, made some other changes. Uh, so Nightmare Magazine is uh, going to be handed over to Wendy Wagner, uh, who will be editor-in-chief of that starting in January. And at the same time, we, we are bringing all three sort of under one umbrella um, that we're calling Adamant Publishing, which is Adams and Yent combined. See how that works. Oh. Um, and also it means we really mean it. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so, so it's, it's, a, it's an umbrella. Um, and uh, eventually we hope to get into um, some long form publishing as well. So cool, cool. It's great because John is... First of all, John's an awesome person. I've been working with him for a long time at this point. And um, it's great because it's, you know, being part of that family um, gives us a little bit more visibility. Mm -hmm. Um, But John is also giving us autonomy, like as a publisher, you know, and um, Christy is also a publisher, but he's pretty much like, this is our magazine. So it's going to bear similarities to light speed and nightmare but it's also going to have differences Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, it's going to represent our taste uh, as opposed to john's taste right right yeah he has he has no oversight at all in our editorial decisions so he has provided us with the infrastructure that again has been there all along um and uh yeah we're really excited to put our our mark on this thing that's awesome that's really cool From a writer perspective, that's excellent because, of course, you write something, it's not going to fit with everybody's Mm -hmm. vision, right? And the more stuff that's under, you know, one person's jurisdiction, if you don't click with their style, right, then you're you're not going to get anywhere, right? So if if you guys are doing your own independent thing, that's yet another avenue to look at for people with a different style. That's great. Yeah, there's a reason there are so many years bests in our uh, in our field, <laughs> because yeah. no t- no two editors have the same taste, yes. right? So yeah, yeah, for sure. So speaking of taste, this segues perfectly into another question I had. Arlie, I've seen you talking about uh, genre and genre distinctions and that sort of thing on Twitter. What you know, and, and this isn't just a question for Arlie, but uh, what what do you both see as as your vision for the magazine, like, how would you define your vision of what fantasy is? Okay, well, um, I think in terms of vision of the magazine, really more important than genre definitions is the fact that we want to be a welcoming market to new voices, which is why we do anonymous first reads to sort of level the playing field. In terms of genre definitions, in terms of taste, you know, for me, I read very broadly. I read literary, I, I read mainstream, I read horror, I, you know, I read lots of different stuff. I like lots mm-hmm. of different stuff. So for me, even if it's like barely fantasy, even if it's arguable, if it's fantasy, and I think a great example is Rachel Swirsky's If You're a Dinosaur, My Love, which was, um, you know, hotly debated people were upset that it got published in Apex. They were livid. They were writing mean comments. They were like, this isn't fantasy. You know, I believe it won awards and people were like, Mm -hmm. this isn't fantasy. How could it win awards? This is a travesty. You know, and for me, it's like, you know what? Like, it's an awesome story. Like that story had me bawling. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I can make it fantasy in my mind and that's good enough for me. And the fact that, you know, she wrote that, in this weird tense and pulled it off as a story and had people bawling. Like you guys are missing the point getting so caught up in the conversation about, you know, if it has a right to be here or not, like you're Mm -hmm. missing out because you're so distracted by, you know, your own whatever agendas and your own need to like dominate the conversation. It's like, relax, just enjoy this story and, you know, enjoy it for what it is. So for me, I, I mean, I respect that everyone has their own vision of what constitutes fantasy. And there are people who feel like, you know, I, I posted in Twitter, I was like, hey, guys, how do you define dark fantasy versus horror? Mm-hmm. And Datlow, Datlow has a very specific 
definition. And I, I, I recently reviewed um, Final Cut's uh, new anthology by her. And in it, I basically said, you know, Datlo, at her, you know, she's received so many accolades at her position in genre. She basically is an authority. Like, horror mm-hmm. is horror. She says it's horror. That's it. But for me, you know, I respect that everyone has their own definitions, but I don't really care as much. And I can squint my eyes and call something fantasy, and that's good enough for me. I'm more interested in, you know, what the story does, how it does it, if it's effective or not, if it does something new or different, if it moves me. I want fiction to do something. I don't want it to just be like, oh, hey, I wrote an elf, publish it. It's like, okay, what is your elf doing? Um, Why should I care? Why should I publish this? And I, I'm more likely to fight to publish something that people might think isn't fantasy that I will argue is over a story about an elf that is just like, okay, you're totally derivative and don't do anything interesting. Yeah. Yeah. This is one of the things that Arlie and I definitely line up on. And and I, I tend to like those, those edge cases and the, the sort of liminal stories as well. Um, and I'm, you know, much less interested in the tropes. Yeah. So that that's, we have that in common for sure. Yeah. And I, I mean, you can, you can hit tropes and do it well, but yeah, you know, I just, I just want really solid, really good fiction that does something that is interesting in some way. And, mm-hmm. you know, give me a reason to publish it. Yeah. I think a, a strong voice and uh, something to say will trump a trope anytime. Yeah. People have asked me, you know, because I slush, I slushed for John for a while now too. I started slushing a while ago for Lightspeed and Nightmare, and people ask me sometimes what I think John likes, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, I like John doesn't like to say because he doesn't want to cut anybody yeah. off, but he will yeah. say stuff. But I, you know, and I told him this recently. I tell people I feel like John likes stories that are interesting but at the end of the day they talk about people you know in some way like whatever the story is doing it comes back to how that story impacts people yeah. it's funny that you say that about john because like about two years ago i interviewed neil clark and he's like oh, i'm really looking for the whatever whatever and he's like but please don't ever tell anybody i said that because i will get nothing else <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely yeah, we we do at Locus. We send out uh, the magazine summary emails, and John is always like, "Oh, I don't want to say because people will only send me that, and I don't want people to do that." Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I as as a writer, I always hated being told, "Well, you know, read the market, read the market, and find out what they yeah. like." You know, I, it's easier now that so much is online and free, right? That that wasn't possible when we had to subscribe to everything in paper, and it was really expensive. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. but, uh, I mean, Lightspeed is a really good example of, yeah, yeah read it and find out because the thing is that his, his tastes are so broad. That was really his whole point in launching Lightspeed in the first place was that he wanted to really showcase how broad a genre science fiction is. So, I mean, you know, what is he looking for? He's looking for a really well-written story as are we. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody, you heard that here. <laughs> that's right, right. well <laughs> right well uh arlie i mean i, I probably I, I started i tried to write for a very short period of time like five years ago when i was unemployed i definitely sent something to light speed you're probably like mm, what is this crap get this out of here <laughs> <laughs> no 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 we never think that no no we are much more friendly than that <laughs> when we're reading slush i promise the thing, the thing about um, writing, because I I haven't been writing lately, and you said you wrote something years ago. Yeah. The thing about writing is you can always put it down, and then you can always come back to yeah. it. So, um, why focus on fantasy? I mean, do, are you picking that up because the horror and science fiction were already taken, or is there something particular you want to do with fantasy? I think you kind of partially already answered that question, but I kind of um wanted to clarify that it's uh i mean that's just where my heart is i you know i always have uh gravitated toward fantasy fiction in my reading and and in my writing mm-hmm. um it is sort of my 
mental aesthetic and uh and that's that's what i wanted to do and you know if if fantasy uh, magazine hadn't necessarily been available to do this uh you know, as a, an umbrella to work under, we would have found another way. It was what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I think we would have done something. I mean, John's not gonna, we'd have to wrestle John for light speed. (laughs) (laughs) You know, too much respect for Wendy to wrestle Wendy for nightmare. And I think she would kill me. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, fantasy was a thing but i mean with even within fantasy i think the mistake that people make a lot of times is that they think that it's one thing and that it looks like one thing yeah. and um you know fantasy can look like so many things and it can be so many things it can take so many shapes and it can be elves and it can be on a spaceship you know uh like star wars really is fantasy for yeah. example I have elves on a spaceship in one of my stories. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm glad you're open to it. Normally you mention elves and everyone's like, I'm out. <laughs> Screw this. <laughs> I read this really cool story in um, one of George Martin's, I think it's George and Gardner, the Warriors anthologies, where it's like, oh, yeah. I think the story is like, basically boils down to elves versus space vampires or werewolves (laughs) versus space vampires but it turns out to be a really good story Uh, and like if you told me yeah it's werewolves versus space vampires or something like that i'd be like okay i hope you can you know make that a great narrative and meaningful as well but you know it's like that would be fantasy sure you know yeah we like dark stuff um so i mean yeah house of fallen leaves you know is a great example of something that could be considered dark fantasy yeah well and let and let's not forget that lightspeed and nightmare are both publishing fantasy as well so lightspeed is not just science fiction uh he does half and half so literally every issue is half science fiction half fantasy and then um, nightmare has been horror and dark fantasy. So, yeah, it wasn't that anything was taken. You know, we're 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 all doing it. We're all just doing right. it our our way. Right. You know, you're right. You're right. And I do. I actually. Um, I I do. Uh, I don't know. I hate to say subscribe. I support Lightspeed through Patreon, and and they're one of the ones that actually I actually listen to through the podcast more than I do read them because I just oh. don't have the time to read everything I want to read. You know what I mean? And and Stefan's amazing. So yeah. oh, oh my God, yes, he is amazing. <laughs> this is a total sidetrack here, but wow, that guy. And uh, yeah. who's he work with? Um, uh, so he he owns and runs Skyboat Media with uh, his partner yes, Gabriel. Gabriel Gabriel De Cure. Yep. Oh my God, yes. they are both so good. Do they do any books? We are s- because they do. Yeah, yeah. Look up Skyboat Media. They do all kinds of books. Okay. Um. Yeah, they've done many, many, many. So. Um, they, they are audiobook uh, publishers. That's their ma- that's their main gig. And they actually, <laughs> Stefan and, and Gabby do this uh, for us out of love. And we are so lucky to have them. And I just, I still, I can't believe they've stayed with us for 10 years now. And just, yeah, we thank our lucky stars every day. So. Yeah. Yeah, they're both so good. And Steve Rodnicki is this guy, in case it, listeners don't know, he's he's got like the bassiest of the bass voices. Uh, I mean, so deep. <laughs> and mm-hmm. and then he does the female <laughs> characters and he's got like this voice worked out. And it's, I mean, like it doesn't take you out of the story at all. It's just, it's amazing. It's amazing that he can do that. Yeah, It's just so, yeah. so good. Um, uh, Diane, do you have any questions about the magazine? Because I'm kind of feeling like moving on to some other stuff. You asked the questions I would have asked, right? We, we kind of, you know, wanted to get a sense of, you know, what the vision was. I think we've got that. And that's really cool. And I'm looking forward to having a new market to submit my stuff to. And that's great. Um, yeah. No, go ahead. Move on, Alan. It's fine. Okay. Um, Christy, we just interviewed Cadwell Turnbull. Cat, Cat Rambo and I did just like, um, it just came out, in awesome. fact, like last week, I think, or the week before. And he talked about the uh, Triptych series of anthologies that you did with uh, John Joseph Adams. Yeah, and Hugh Howey. And Hugh Howey, that's right, that's right. And here's kind of the breakdown for the listeners. Um, They're dystopian. Uh, There's kind of like a before the dystopia, a during the dystopia, and an after the dystopia. And 
I mean, I just have never heard of a project quite like that. Can you explain like where that came from, what inspired it? And, and again, like why, why are you doing that now? Yeah. So this is, this is actually something that John and Hugh did uh, once before they did the apocalypse triptych oh, several okay. years ago. Um, and so that one was a little more clean cut, right? Before the apocalypse, during the apocalypse, after the apocalypse. And, and you may, um, may or may not know that, you know, John's anthology career really started with uh, Wastelands, um, The Living Dead, and Brave New Worlds. So he right. was very much in the apocalypse and dystopia genres, right. uh, and he will lecture you if you confuse the two, so <laughs> just don't. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and so they, they had planned this triptych for a while, and um, uh, was it a year or two years ago, I got to work with Hugh and uh, Gary Witta on a different anthology called Resist, uh, Tales from a Future Worth Fighting Against, which um, was also of a dystopian nature and all the proceeds for that, not all the proceeds, most of the proceeds for that went to the ACLU. So that was a, a charity uh, anthology we had done together. So um, when they finally got this this triptych off the ground, they asked me to come help because I'd already worked with you and I'd already done the dystopian thing with him as well. So, um, so this is a continuation of a, an idea that they had um, why now? I mean, <laughs> hi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, Everyone this is, just this falls is, We're living the laughs. second book yeah. right now. We're living the second book. Yeah. So, um, I keep saying over and over again, this is the cyberpunk dystopia that we tried to warn you exactly, about. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. And, and Cadwell was, uh, he's always so great to work with. Yeah. And I'm so glad that you interviewed him because he's just, uh, he was, yeah, he's, uh, I am a big Cadwell cheerleader. Um, and his stories are amazing in that triptych, but, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's the story. It was, uh, it was a previously planned thing. And then, you know, the world just lined up and went here, oh, wow. <laughs> I guess <laughs> art, art, please reflect life now. That's, oh, gosh. <laughs> so, I know it's miserable, isn't it? Uh, I, I wrote an article for this, um, uh, uh online thing that I do with a bunch of other writers called our own worlds. Right. And it was, I called something like uh, how being a sci-fi writer prepared me for the pandemic. Yes. Did it not? <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. I was like, okay. Yeah. I know exactly what to do. Here yeah. We, we have, we have all <laughs> gamed this one out in our heads way before yeah. this was a reality. So, Yep. <laughs> Yeah, so put your masks on, damn it! Oh, God, okay, I anyway, know. Sorry. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, that was, that's just so, that's that's such a cool little project. Um, I, I encourage our listeners to definitely go and check that out. If you didn't after the Cadwell episode, definitely go and check that out after this one. I, I would also like to check it out. I've got to figure out how to read more faster. <laughs> I know, it's a problem, right? <laughs> it is I know. seriously a problem. <laughs> all the books and a lot of people don't like to say it but we truly are living in a golden age of science fiction and fantasy in my opinion and um it's uh yeah, yeah. it's a good problem to have arlie we're gonna switch gears a minute here let's talk about interviewing a little bit you you interview uh for clark's world lightspeed and uh locus so that's kind of a big deal you know why why do you enjoy doing all, all these interviews so what's what uh motivates you to do that why do I enjoy doing them? Well, clearly you do, right? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, to be honest, I don't think a lot about why I enjoy doing them. But I mean, I just really like interacting with other creative types. And I guess it provides a context to do that. And um, a side benefit that I really like about it, that it, I didn't realize at first is that when you interview, you research beforehand and you kind of look deeper into what people are doing. I especially like this about doing spotlights for light speed because, uh, you know, you read the short story and then you kind of have to really dig into it to come up with decent questions. Mm -hmm. And it makes you read on a different level and understand things on a different level and think about things on a different level, which I think is just really fun. Mm -hmm. Using that English degree. I'm assuming that you have one. <laughs> <laughs> I studied Asian religion. 
Okay. <laughs> I totally missed the target on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you, by the way. I think it's really cool to, you know, learn about what other creatives are doing. And also, I find it's fun because then I get to talk to people who I would not, who I want to talk to, but I would not have the courage to go and strike yeah. up that conversation if I met them in real life, not even at a convention. I, I just wouldn't do it, right? I'm an introvert. I have social anxiety. This is much more, you know, uh, yeah. at my speed. And then I get to talk to cool pe people like you guys, right? And that for me is, you know, so I, I, I relate with that whole connect yeah. to the creative Absolutely. thing. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It gives you a broader perspective on the field as well. And it, it doesn't always happen, but once in a while you really click with someone. Like I interviewed Cadwell for uh, Locus and we really clicked and now we're friends and we hang out in cons and stuff. Um, and uh, that might not have happened if I hadn't done that interview. So Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I've, I've made uh, friends through interviewing as well. I mean, Kat and Diane are just two examples. Of the, of the many friends I've made from doing the podcasts and all the interviewing, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And so like when you're interviewing somebody, do you have, um, I know, and I know it's different for every place that you interview. So this is kind of like a general question, maybe, um, when you get to pick, what are there like any topics or themes that you try to interrogate or do you try to take a different approach with each writer and just like find out who they are or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, we all have our own agendas, our own politics, our own views on on life. And I think that's always going to guide, you know, where we take conversations to a degree. But I usually try to, I try to be mindful of who I think the person is or who the person seems to be and um, my job, my first job as an interviewer is to create space for them mm -hmm. to talk about whatever they want to talk about. That's kind of my current operating philosophy. And, um, but the other thing is, is that I also know that people often get asked the same questions over and over, and then they don't get asked certain questions especially depending on where they're being interviewed or what the purpose of the interview is. So, I mean, one thing I do is I research their prior, their most recent prior interviews, and I always try to come up with something to talk about that they haven't been asked before, at least one or two questions. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that, you know, I do like to be, a little little bit progressive and i will tend to ask questions for example if i'm interviewing someone who's not a straight white male one of the things that i ask is what their first stories that they wrote were like because something i discovered is that with most authors who aren't straight white males almost always their first stories have straight white male protagonists um, and I only started realizing this after doing a number of interviews. So I've sort of fine-tuned the question in a way that hopefully creates an open platform for the conversation to potentially go somewhere that is interesting and socially relevant, mm -hmm. but doesn't, you know, I don't I also don't want to force them to have a conversation that they don't want to have. So I think there's a fine line. But if you don't ask those questions then they don't become part of the culture. And personally, I feel like those discussions need to be part of the culture because, you know, without those discussions, you don't really realize the things that happen, the things and their impact, their relevance. Like, for example, a lot of people talk about, um, the, you know, they want representation, but they're not as focused on what happens when you don't have representation, what is the impact of that? And this is one of the, you know, measurable, provable direct impacts is that when people don't see themselves in fiction, they don't feel like they have the right to write themselves. And it's so messed up. And, you know, so I, I try to sort of 
participate in the uh, dialogue that happens in genre, essentially. And I try to help people participate in that, but I also don't want to force people to. And, you know, sometimes people, you know, for example, just because somebody is a woman and an author, that doesn't necessarily mean they want to talk about being a woman in science fiction. You know, mm-hmm. I actually know a couple of authors like that who are not interested in that conversation. Um, but a lot of other authors are. So first and foremost is just creating space for people and trying to discover what they want to talk about, but also trying to make that conversation interesting and relevant to now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's fantastic. I really appreciate that viewpoint. That's excellent. Thank you. Give space for, you know, people who have been traditionally marginalized. That's excellent. Thank you for doing that. (laughs) Thank you for doing that work. Thanks. I appreciate it. (laughs) This kind of segues into another thing I wanted to talk about. Um, A question for both of you, like, how do you try to resist the norm through um, fiction or narrative? It's a very deep question. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I feel like Arlie said a lot about that, if not uh, directly. Um, uh, boy, Arlie, yeah. you're better at this. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of editorial decision making, you know, it comes down to you know, part of, part of it is about taste. And it's not like a story has to match my personal politics or agenda for a story to be good. Mm-hmm. But there is an element of what is this story saying? And no matter, you know, like you can be an author and pretend like your story doesn't have politics. It's not putting out a message. You can tell yourself that you're not putting out messages. But no matter what, your story is going to represent yourself in different ways whether or not that's intended and um, you may mm-hmm. think that your story isn't putting out messages but your story is putting out messages and people will read messages through that story and so I think part of part of being relevant part of you know being part of the conversation comes down to you know the feeling the vibe what what's going on in the story uh, and I think that the best stories, do say something in some way, you know, whether it's general or specific, whether it's like, you know, oh, you know, that dude who's in office is terrible, or whether it's more like, you know, like one of my favorite stories is Araby, for example, by James Joyce, one of my Mm -hmm. all-time favorite stories. And in this story, um, you have this kid who has a crush on somebody, and so he says yo, I'm going to go get you something from the market, from the bazaar. And she's like, whatever. And so uh, he goes to find something and the whole thing becomes a mess. And at the end, he's in this really foul mood. And the whole the whole thing is like, it portrays this shift in focus from like upbeat, uh, affectionate, Um, positivity to, you know, it's talking about the way that we as people change who we are in the moment because we're focused on the wrong thing, Mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, suddenly this character is focused on getting a thing. Um, And so that story to me is saying something really important, but it's not necessarily about, you know, who is the president at the time or anything like that. So a story can contribute to Um, the conversations of the moment in important ways and what that conversation can be so many different things. But for me, the best stories usually are saying something beyond just like, you know, a dude's trying to buy something. Yeah. 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 I'm thinking about my own sort of editorial past here so far and, and virtually everything that I've edited has been inherently political. Um, so that is certainly part of it. I mean, p- one of the reasons that I did uh, Women Destroy Science Fiction years ago was that there was a a norm, right, a narrative norm, that uh, women don't write science fiction, mm-hmm. or we don't write the right kind of science mm-hmm. fiction, or we're, you know, mucking up dude science fiction by describing the curtains or whatever the complaints were. Mm-hmm. Um, but also there was this inner narrative um, 
of women in science fiction who were telling themselves that they couldn't write it because they didn't have the science and that only physics and starships and spacemen were science fiction. And that's not true, right? Um, the social sciences are sciences. Um, the Handmaid's Tale is science fiction, uh, period. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one of the things that I mm -hmm. wanted to communicate and one of the things that I wanted um, other women to understand was that, yes, you can. It just doesn't look like the science fiction you've been told is the only right kind. Um, and yes, of course, we can write those things as well. I can write a space marine just like anybody else. I've written sure. armored, I've written mechs, I've, you know, but that's not mm -hmm. usually my jam. Um, and in fact, one of my authors in WDSF, uh, Amal, actually, uh, Amal El Motar, she, um, I asked her to write a story and she was like, I write fantasy. I'm like, I know. <laughs> and, it, and it took her a while. Um, and she, she really struggled. Um, but at the end of it, it was like, look, I asked you to write the story because I know your voice. And I think that this, this volume is missing something like what you write. And I think the poetry and the lyricism and the metaphor and all of that beauty that you bring to fantasy, you're going to be able to bring to science fiction. So do it. And she did it. And it was amazing. And, um, you know, so, so there, there are a lot of norms. There are a lot of narratives that need changing. Um, that is one way to do it. Um, uh, others, I, I find that um, I'm a consulting editor for Tor.com's novella line. And I'm finding that most of the stuff that I'm gravitating toward has a lot of women and queer characters in it. And just normalizing that, that is, that's what I want to read right now. I am tired of reading and writing about straight white men's problems. And I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, all of the straight white, white men out there. I, I value you. I appreciate you. I've just read, give me something new, please. You know, um, in the literary, in the literary genre, right. There's, there's the, um, uh, the college professor with the, you know, mad crush on their grad student <laughs> yeah. story. Right. We've read it in, in, you know, we've read it a thousand times. Um, in uh, science fiction and fantasy, you know, the the cliches are different, but they're there. Um, so, yeah, g give us something new. Give us. Uh, and like Arlie said, all of my first stories, they all had male protagonists. I didn't know that I was allowed to write about myself. Yeah. So, huh. yeah, like I just want to reiterate what Chrissy just said, because those are really important things to me as well. And um, this is part of why when Christy and I hung out, we just really clicked and we're like, let's do this together. I mean, you know, there are plenty of markets where you can sell your straight white male meets hot babe fantasy science fiction piece. You know, yeah. one of the worst, I won't say who, but one of the worst uh, science fiction stories I ever read was in a professional anthology by a super established author and um basically what happens is this dude who is like space pilot dude you know walks into a uh spaceship and the spaceship is female and pretty much in walking into the spaceship the oh. female spaceship has an orgasm and i'm like oh god i'm like this is this is the problem with genre oh. I don't have a problem with orgasms. I don't have a problem with heterosexual sex. I don't have a problem with dudes being the protagonist. I have a problem with that this is what the story is about and this sold and that somebody got paid for it and that this is it. This is the story. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's going to be a lot harder to sell a story to our market like that unless you have a lot more to say than just that. Um, and for both Christy and I, we're like, this is the problem with genre right now is yeah. that People who have names sell stories that would not sell if they didn't have that name. Uh, they don't have to try as hard. And that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons we do anonymous submissions, because if we buy your story, it's not going to be, be because you have, you know, a shelf full of awards. It's not going to be because you are a friend of ours. It's going to be because we read that story and it really did something for us. Yeah. And and we both are going to be 
more interested in stories that are not being told to death by people who are telling them to death. We're going to be more interested in queer stories, more interested in, you know, trans um, and be, um, you know, everything. Just everybody needs to feel welcome. By POC, for sure. Yeah. POC, yeah. everybody needs to feel like, you know, at the end of the day, Christy and I both feel like it comes down to um, that that person who looks at the market and feels like nobody wants to read their story. We want them to feel like we want to read your story. We want, yeah. we want to see yeah. what you have to say. We want to really try and get you. And you have as much chance as anybody else of selling us a story. May, in some cases, probably, you know, a better chance. Yeah. That's awesome. And, and as, as a straight white male guy, I, I completely agree. Uh, first of all, that story was ridiculous. Like, I can't believe I, it's like, it's so absurd. Like I'm over here, like, like blushing. It's so dumb. You know what I mean? It's just... I, I literally, I will never read that editor again. <laughs> mm. And I decided at that point, I will never read that author again. Like yeah. for me personally, there's so much fiction out there. There's so many people doing great things there's no reason for me to waste time reading somebody who is going to waste my time. I yeah. have no time for that. You know, there's, there are a million anthos happening. I don't care. You know, you don't need to be published by, you know, like um, a Phoenix first must burn is a great anthology out with Viking um, by Patrice uh, Caldwell. It's awesome. It's like black voices, front and center uh poc voices there are queer stories there are young stories it's like all kinds of cool stuff and i'm like yes like this is the stuff that we're not getting enough of and we get way too much of just stuff that nobody is challenging these authors nobody is saying is this the whole story like that's it all right guys well um we are getting low on time here diane is there any final questions or thoughts you want to throw in here? Oh, well, just our usual questions for our guests, our usual last yeah, one, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. What gives you guys hope in this time? <laughs> what gives me hope, you know, is just cool people and cool stories. A lot of stories that I see in the slush pile are fantastic. And I'm just like, wow, this is awesome. It's awesome that people are talking about this. It's awesome that people are writing this. There's the the base level of stories that we see is pretty high um and cool people like um you know even if like i tend to ignore a lot of the bs on twitter but i'm on twitter a fair amount and there's so many cool people on there who are just caring and open and want to learn and want to share and that's what gives me hope yep yeah. Awesome. Yeah. People like you, <laughs> you guys, you guys Thank give you. us hope, um, you know, people who are, who are trying to move this whole genre forward and, and uh, in doing so moving, you know, society forward. Um, everybody please go subscribe to FIA magazine. Um, FIA yes. gives me hope. Um, Absolutely. You know, that's yeah. yeah. People are trying to change things and, and those are the people who are giving me hope right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm glad you, you threw that in, in that shout out to Fire because they are doing amazing work. Yep. They are really doing yes. amazing yep. work. And you know, aside from the fact that this is something that is really needed in the genre, it's so good. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's just so good. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. All right. Well, um, thanks so much for. Co oh, uh, before we go, geez. What what projects are you guys working on um, other than Fantasy Magazine? Or, like, when is Fantasy Magazine coming out? You know, uh, what are you guys up to? Tell us that before we go. Arlie, you go first. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, Fantasy Magazine is my prioritized project right now. Um, Christy is... She's been involved with Lightspeed and Nightmare and everything since the beginning. She's done a lot of... Uh, you know, a lot of stuff in genre. For me, Fantasy Magazine, it's a lot newer for me. 
Um, so this is this is my big project. Uh, and of course, I'm doing all the other stuff that I normally do. But Fantasy Magazine, mm-hmm. for me, is the new thing that I'm excited about and that I want people to know about. Yeah. Likewise, um, right now for me, it, you know, fantasy, uh, we're just we're getting ready to start choosing our first stories for our first issue. We're very excited about that. So Arlie and I have a meeting in a couple of weeks where we're going to give each other our top tens, and oh, it's going to be great. Um, be other cool. other than that, I um, Amy Ogden's uh, novella Sun Daughters Sea Daughters is going to be coming out from Tor.com um, in April, and we just got to see her cover, and I can't wait for the cover reveal. Oh. Um, so yeah, so I continue to work on on the Tor.com novellas, and and those are a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, fantasy is is what uh, that's where my heart is right now. That's that's where my time goes. Awesome. It's our baby. Brilliant. <laughs> Fantasy's our baby. Yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> where do people find you on the web? Both uh, as your magazine and, you know, on social media, if you want to throw in a couple of things. Fantasy-magazine.com is the uh, magazine website. Um, and then Arlie is way more involved in social media than I am. So, Yeah, I'm, I'm Arlie Sorg on most stuff. My website is Arlie Sorg, my Twitter, my Facebook. And I'm mo- I engage people more on Twitter than anything else. Right. Yeah. And I'm and I'm kind of doing the fantasy magazine Twitter as well, but I'll engage people more on my own Twitter. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show, guys. You were amazing. And people like you give me oh, hope. So this, is, this is just great. Thank you so much. Thank for you that. so much for having us. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah thanks for having us. We really appreciate it. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. And so that was Arlie Sorg and Christy Yant. That was a cool conversation, right? They were awesome. I I just love what they're doing. I I love their vision for Fantasy mm-hmm. Magazine. I I've already got like, oh, here's some story ideas I've had that I think would fit what they're doing. You know, that always makes yeah. me excited. And I had an idea for a story in the process of the conversation, which again is like really good. No, they're, they're, I I just I love their vision. I like them as yeah. people, right? Clearly they're you know, trying to do good things in the genre and in the world. I, I felt, uh, I, I liked the opportunity to talk to Christy because I was, I was very excited about women destroy science uh-huh. fiction and it, you know, she's talking about all the reasons why that was created. And she's, you know, talks about how, you know, like we, we hear women can't write. Someone actually told me that to my oh, face. Oh, I'm glad you're you're writing fantasy because I was at the time, right? Because women can't write science yeah. fiction, right? And how furious it made me! How I started writing a novel just out of spite. Yeah, it's hard, hard science fiction. So yeah, I I totally I totally feel that, and it it's good that they want to kick down some doors. Yeah, yeah, I, that whole women can't write science fiction thing makes me crazy. I I. For a long time. Women invented the fucking genre. I'm sorry. No worries. No worries. Women invented the genre. Yes, absolutely. Right? Women invented the genre. Women have always been a part of the genre. Women have done things that have been, like, have always been there. Right? It's, 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 it's not new. Yes. (laughs) You know? It just makes me so angry. I'm like, will you please read some classics that are not by Heinlein, Clark, or... As the whole, that you whole know? canon conversation is going on right now too and, and social media and yeah i mean you're totally right it's just it's just a dumb social construct you know it's i can tell you being a straight male white guy when i first started reading women authors i was actually like i don't know weirdly concerned about it i mean i was open to it but i was like oh it's just gonna be really romancy Ugh, it's gonna be really romancy and because that's what you're told, yeah. right? This is how it's always yep. marketed, right? This is yep. th- this is what quote everybody knows, yep. right? And it, and it's not. And of course, it's nonsense. <laughs> I mean, like, Cat has one of my favorite takes on mermaids ever. You you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and it's vicious yep. as hell. <laughs> it's not like a friendly, happy, shiny, sparkly thing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's and you know, people of color, queer people. 
science fiction and fantasy has always been a place for people who don't fit very well in other mm-hmm. places, right? So these voices have always been there. But for some reason, whenever the conversation gets started about, well, who are the canon, mm-hmm. right? And if people always treat it like somebody new, like what was what was her name? Uh, Joanna Roos, yeah. right? I, I read a book that Kat recommended to me, right? Uh, called the uh, oh sh- damn, I can't remember the title now, but it's about how um, the the ways in which uh, women's writing, yes, uh, what is it? How to destroy women's writing or something mm-hmm. like that, right? And it's there's always you know there's room for a smurfette right you can have one right who's acknowledged as part of the canon right if you if you talk about uh the classic writers of science fiction somebody will always say well what about ursula Le Guin?" Yeah. you know and people are like oh yeah 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 yeah. but there were a lot more people there and they had a lot more influence on it you know queer voices you know you'll I don't know. It's, it's it's a big soapbox issue for me, so I get emotional. Yeah, sure. It. I mean, I mean, you have a right for it to yeah. be an emotional reaction to that. You know, um, it, it's it's your life, right? <laughs> I mean, it's something that you right. love dearly, and and you're a woman, and it's like, it, it's just a it's just preposterous. And people who say that don't know what they're talking about, frankly. I mean, but I was thinking about how Arlie was saying that you know he asks his uh, interview subjects, what were your first stories like? My first stories actually weren't about a white male protagonist. And the reason why, right, is because I remember being eight or nine years old and I read The Blue Sword. Mm -hmm. I'll remember that one. And I, I just remember how taken I was by the whole concept. I was like, you mean women can be the heroes in the sword and sorcery story? Wow this is my thing. And so I, I, because that was an early experience when I started, you know, writing like I meant it, which was early, like yeah. 10, right. I, w- I was 10 years old when I knew this is what I wanted to do. I was, I would, I just, st- I started with girls, right. Who were like me. That's awesome. And so maybe that's changing is my point. Maybe, maybe, you know, I'm an early adopter and maybe that's going to be a trend. God, I, hope so. I think it's headed that way, but are we ready to to review some books here? Absolutely. I'm sorry. I haven't done any reading at all this month. No, I'm a terrible no fan worries. because I've been so busy, but I can't wait to hear what you've been reading. No worries. I have two books that were published locally in Pittsburgh or by local publishers, I should say. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, the first one you actually know and have been, well, you haven't been published in this book, but you've been published by this press. Um, it's called Nevermore Earth. Uh And that is spelled N-E-V-E-R-M-O-R-E-A-R-T-H. And the stories are by L.R. Ambrose, Jamie Lackey, Colin O'Brien, Sarah Daly, or Daly, not sure, and P. DeJelly Clark. And it's published by Air and Nothingness Press. Air and Nothingness Press puts out some good stuff. It was a real honor to be published with them. Yeah, they really do. Um, This one was published in 2019. Uh, and this is the second time I've, I've, I've reviewed their stuff because I reviewed uh, the cities of dust planes of light that you were in, I think. Oh, nice. Before we were on a podcast together, I think. Can't. Cool. Must have been because I never heard it. I haven't heard that review. <laughs> I hope you liked it. Uh oh. No, no, it was good. <laughs> I only review stuff I like. So, yeah. You know. I know. It's cool. I'm, <laughs> I'm just teasing you, really. It's fine. Just don't read the part where I say, except for that one story. It's really fine. You know what? I read uh, I read a review on that particular book that was not very pleasant in a really? very well known. Oh yes, and that's okay. You know what? Uh, I got thick skin. It's it's fine. That's dumb. you know. Um. Okay. So uh, let's see. So just to kind of describe what's going on here a little bit. Their anthologies uh, usually have a theme and are usually very short and focused. In this case, there are six stories with the theme of Dying Earth, um, similar cool. to stories like Jane Wolf might have done or Jack Vance. Um, sure. And, you know, and the world is kind of coming to a close and dying, thus dying. Gotcha. Yeah. You know. And uh, one of those aspects, too, is the, the difference between, uh, you can't really tell the difference between technology and magic, because a lot of them are actually far future stories that just seem like fantasy, right? Awesome. Um, so in this anthology, there's a pretty good range between sci-fi and fantasy feels. 
Although the majority of the stories uh, seem to be more solidly into the fantasy side. Uh, five of the six stories are really short, with the Clark story taking about half the anthology itself, actually. All the stories, totally solid. Uh, Clark's was by far my favorite. Um, the story itself chronicles some adventures had by a musician who begins uh, the story by owing a wizard a gambling debt. Uh, and he's unable to pay his debts and is marooned on a floating island. It was really, really fun kind of story. Um, had had some humor to it. It reminded me a lot of uh, the Northwest Smith stories by C.L. Moore. But was oh, more of a, cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I love C.L. Moore. So. Yeah. Um, it had a little more of a Middle Eastern fantasy setting to it, though, which also very cool. I love I love settings like that. And I might as well say now, but we will be interviewing uh, Mr. P. DeJelly Clark uh, Ooh. at some point in the future. Yeah. Clapping hands. I'm excited. I can't wait. Yeah. I just got an email from him a couple days yes. ago. So I'm very excited about that. Me too. The other story I, I want, really want to talk about was by Jamie Lackey. Uh, it's a very grim story. And if you've listened to this podcast or past podcasts that I've been in, I always talk up Jamie Lackey because she's awesome. And she, she does is not, awesome. Yeah, she just does not get the press that she deserves. She's fantastic. I know, right? <sighs> anyway. She was, she was in uh, Cities of Dust, Planes of Light, too. And her Indeed. story was just astounding. Blew my mind. Yeah. I, I will say, as a total side note, Erin Nothingness Press actually um, uh, has kind of brought her under their wing and, and publishes tons of her stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. She has two collections through them. One I have sitting right here, like I, I'm touching it right now, uh, which I will be reviewing at some point. Um, let's see. Oh, her story was called A Slow Descent into Darkness, in which um, a young person contemplates how they will attempt to hold back the end of the world. So... Pretty good. Uh, there was another one in there. Um, it was kind of a Vance pastiche by L.R. Ambrose and a more humorous story about a barbarian and a witch matching wits uh, by Colin O'Brien called Someone of Her Skill. Um, huh. And uh, just all around pretty good. If you like Dying Earth, go get it. There's a wide range of stories. And if you enjoy boutique publishers, actually, I'm going to just recommend all of Air and Nothingness Press for that because... Their covers are just like their art. I mean, they're just... their their books are works of art. Yes. They are collectors' pieces yes. that you should be proud to have on your shelf. They yes. are amazing. Exactly. Like if you have any books turned face out on your bookshelf, it should be these ones. Yeah. Um next one is Triangulation Dark Skies, edited by Diane Turncheck, who's a a friend of mine in Chloe Nightingale, and that was published by Parsec Inc. in 2019. And uh, we interviewed Diane Tarncheck on my old podcast ages ago. She's an astrologist, actually. And not astrologist. Me. Astrolo- no. Ast- astronomer. astronomer. Yes. Blah. Astrophysicist. Blah. Yes. She's a very smart person. <laughs> okay. Um, I reviewed a number of these uh, over the years. Um, on my old podcast, we had the old editors on every year to talk about it, and they're personal friends of mine too from around the Pittsburgh scene. Um, fun guys. But Diane decided to have a story about uh, the sky um, because she's a, an astronomer. And, and one thing that she works on in her spare time is uh, light pollution. So this, this oh. kind of came out of that. Excellent. I, I'm already intrigued. Light pollution is a huge problem. It for is. observation of the cosmos. It's, yeah, I've, <laughs> I, I feel it. I, I see it, you know, I, I see it as every year less and less of the local sky becomes a good place to, you know, keep track of what's going on out there. Yes, yes. One of these days we're going to miss this great big asteroid because there's too much light pollution. <laughs> You know, Diane, actually, back when we interviewed her, she had a really impo- interesting point, And she pointed out that a lot of um, astronauts come from the Midwest where you can actually see the skies and not the cities. Because in cities, like my kids, I never forget last year, my kids like, is that is that a star? And it was like literally the first time he ever saw a star. And I had never thought of that before. Wow. Because I live in the city. And I was um, like, oh. When I was young, my, my town here was a small town. Right. And I wanted to be an astronaut. Right. Yeah. I'm 
probably because uh, one of the reasons why I write science fiction and fantasy is because it's a, a very happy memory watching the sky with my mom and her teaching me about the different constellations and, you know, doing more research on that on my own because it was just so fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah. And you can't see it now, right? The, my right. town has become a little city. Right. It has expanded considerably and, you know, there's more and more bright lights from the town and more cars and they put an airport, uh, you know, light out by where I used to live, where I was growing up. And, you know, I, I think about, I do think about the experience my kids had and whether it was the same quality mm -hmm. as the experience I had. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's stuff you never really think about. Well, I, I never thought about, you know, and well, uh, let me, let me get back to the, the, yeah, the we're here off real topic quick. Here. Yeah. um, so there's a lot of newer authors to me, but my favorite one was by a guy named Blake Jessup, who I've talked about before in the past. Um, his story was, um, about an anarchist in China trying to save her city from pollution. Um, really fun little story, uh, very snarky, very rebellious, very smart thinking by the author and the character. Um, I, I just really enjoyed it. And if you ever see any of his stuff, most of his work is, is very like punk anarchy kind of themed. So I, in fact, uh, for our friends at Dreamforge published one of his stories, and that's actually probably my favorite story that Dreamforge has ever published. Um, gotcha. Total, another total ramble there, but, uh, go and check that out. If this sounds like something you're interested in, it's a very small press, so I don't know if it's even still, uh, being published, but, uh, you should go and check it out if it's, if it's out there. And and that's it for me. Um, Diane, I think you said you had something you wanted to promote. <laughs> well, you know, it's always it's always hard to get up courage to promote your own stuff, right? But if you don't do it, then nobody else will. So well, that's why I'm calling you out. <laughs> okay, well, call me out. That's great. Um, yeah, I'm uh, in the process of moving my fiction. Uh, this is my longer form stuff in general onto my World Anvil site. They've recently created a feature called manuscripts that basically publish ebooks, you know, quality ebooks online. It's an mm -hmm. editing software. It works a bit like Scrivener, right? And then you just publish it and it's there. So right now you can get Once Upon a Time in the Weird West there. The first chapter is free for anybody to read. After that, you have to be a patron, but you can get all of my fiction, which I... I'm now back on a schedule of publishing one chapter a week for only a dollar per month. So that's out there. I'm also uh, putting up my, uh, this is like my final, final draft of the first book in the Toy Soldier Saga. And uh, it's, it's, so I'm, I'm in the process of serializing that. So there will be a new chapter every week on that too. Awesome. So everyone go and check that out. Um, we also have a Patreon. It's at patreon.com slash if this goes on. You can check that out. Something that we recently did that was kind of cool was we had our patrons vote um, on a future guest and a P. DeJelly Clark won. And Excellent. he's officially going to be on, as I said earlier. So yes. We're very excited about that. Um, we have got, oh, Diane, we've got some really cool guests coming up, I gotta say. I can't, I'm not gonna say on here who. Okay. Some, some of them aren't okay. 100% yet, but so many cool guests coming on. See, Alan does most of the reaching out to people in the community <laughs> uh, behind the scenes, yes. right? And then I, I do some of it within the indie writer community, but he does more of it than I do. So I can't wait to find out. This is news to me too. I, I'd like to think <laughs> I like, spare you all from it. <laughs> You know, it's hard work. People don't realize it, but I've done it, right? Yeah. It's hard work. It's uh, hurting cats. Yes. It's very difficult yes. to line up schedules. Yes. You know, it's scary to approach people brand new that yes. you may or may not have personally met. And yeah, it, yep. you do good work, Alan, and I appreciate it. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Um, it's, yes, it's, it's time consuming and it's, it can be, if there's yes. somebody that you really like that says no, you can be you can be a little crushed by that. But yeah, that's yeah. but anyway, <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you really like what we're doing, you can support us on Patreon.com. Um, if you know, we're also encouraging people to support things like Black Lives Matter or 
uh, you know, politicians who uh, are for equal rights and representation and, and that sort of thing. Um, so if you would rather make a change in the world by doing that, that is perfectly fine. We, we, we yeah, do not absolutely. hold that against you because we're doing okay right now. Um, and so that's, that's all I've got. Anything I'm missing? I don't think so. That was a really great show, Alan. Thanks. I had a great time. Great. Great. Yeah. All right. So goodbye to everybody out there. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Don't Panic is edited by Alan Daly with production by Sound Maiden. Our theme music is by Father Flamethrower. Additional music by Christopher Snydrowski. And outro music by Sable Aradia. Intro by Dave Robinson. Special thanks to our guests, Christy Yam and Arlie Sorg. Thanks for supporting us, and we'll see you again soon.